Thanks. Um, so you, you can read read the Twitter thread that kind of started this off. Kobe thought that Dr. Nick was going to propose something that was about OpenStack stressing him out, and Dr. Nick said, no, that's a, just a good idea. And so I decided to take up that mantle. Um, Kobe's talked about me. I'm a pointy-haired manager, um, so, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, we finished reading the joke. Good. Um, all right. OpenStack stresses me out to no end. There's a great quote from Jamie Zawinski, probably, um, called that some people, when confronted with a problem, think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. And now they have two problems. Well, <laughs> substitute regular expressions for OpenStack and two for 99, at, at least. Um. <laughs> OpenStack is turtles all the way down. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, a term in the web development community of a full stack developer. Um, and I really respect the full stack developers. The full stack developers do CSS and JavaScript and HTML and some middleware and databases. And maybe a little bit of operating system stuff. But that's not the full stack. The full stack keeps going down and down. There's hardware, there's networks, there's security, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, you get into data centers and power and cooling and geo-replication and all kinds of stuff that you don't really always think about. There's a lot of complexity that we built over the last few decades. And unfortunately, OpenStack touches pretty much all of it. Um, so the first area I want to talk about is hardware. Um, Obviously, if you're deploying a cloud, as my team does, um, you want hardware. And you think, well, that's great. I've got hardware, and I'm used to that, and it's stable, and it's useful, and whatever. Um, except, you know, I'm buying a crap ton of it. And you think, that's what my data center looks like. It's, it's beautiful, um, and everything looks the same. And I, I bought, oh, I, I went to my vendor, and I spec specced out this SKU. And I said, hey, this is what I want to buy. And they said, great. We'll give you 10,000 of that server. Awesome. I can't wait to have 10,000 of my server all in my data center and ready to go. Except it looks like that. <laughs> On the inside, right? Somebody grabbed the wrong RAID controller and stuck it in. And it's just got a little bit different version. And it works just a little bit differently. The API is just a little bit different. The performance is just a little bit different. And you have to deal with all of that. Um, and it can be a real pain in the butt. Oh, wait. Let's have more than one vendor. OK, that's not helping. Because <laughs> now I've got multiple servers for computes and storage and all kinds of things. And again, you have to deal with that across many data centers. And then, of course, you have the movement of time. And versions change over time, and things change over time. And so you have to deal with many versions. And oh, well, we don't sell this processor anymore. We sell this processor and this thing. And the features are different. And you have to deal with all of these things. Um, and it's uh, exciting. So one solution for this. Um, is hardware automation. Um, my team works pretty hard on automating not just the configuration of OpenStack, but the configuration of hardware. And when we see differences and we see these idiosyncrasies, they go into our configuration management system just like you know, how we're setting up NTP. 
Um, and that becomes really useful because then when this weird piece of hardware shows up, oh, Chef says, oh, hey, I've got that. Take it over. Um, so, so that's been really useful for us. Um, initially, we actually used Cobbler for this. Um, and it started getting unwieldy really, really quickly. Um, Chef is able to handle a lot better. Um, just the ability to detect, it, it kind of like detects the differences better and you you have a lot more capabilities of handling it. Um, so hard, hardware automation is great. Um, next is good vendor relationships. Really working with our vendors, you know, we tour their facilities, we talk to the actual people building the hardware, work with them, determine your needs and this kind of thing. Um, and, and they, you know, the really good hardware vendors out there will work with you to get a good SKU and get, you know, the, the type of system that you want. So that, that's also really helpful. Uh, the next area is networking. Um, networking is not simple. Um, at all. Uh, there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, somebody plugged this thing into the wrong switch. Oh, we forgot to pl plug this server in two switches. It's only in one switch. And then when you lose the one switch, oh, well, there goes any kind of redundancy you have in the system. Um, then you have the issues of, of scaling the network and dealing with tenant management and this kind of thing. Um, there's there's lots of problems around you know making sure that uh, your multi-tenant uh, OpenStack deployment actually handles all your tenants and gives good quality of service across the board. Um, and so uh, you know things that help here are really good telemetry um, on your networks. So you can know what's going on. You know that, oh, hey, I've got a spike in utilization. What is this? Where is that coming from? OK, now I know where it's coming from. What is it? Um, and it, it helps you detect things really quickly. Um, you know, Early on, we didn't have a lot of this. And when you get a compromised VM that starts going crazy and starts packet storms and this kind of thing, you're, you're kind of like shooting in the dark. Um, having mechanisms to actually figure out what's going on is, is incredibly important. Um, and also having uh, quality service features, being able to rate limit tenants and say, hey, slow down, dude. You don't need to like send packets out that much um, is also quite useful because um, you don't, you know, you can have a single VM go nuts and take out a whole data center if you're not careful. Software-defined networking. Um, you'd hope this would make things easier, but yeah. It, it provides a lot of the things that, that uh, you really need in a multi-tenant environment. Um, security, isolation, tenant isolation, quality of service, monitoring, metrics. Um, you get a lot more control over the system now because it's just software and it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, so when you're configuring things, it works great. So, so um, OVS is awesome. It's got one kind of fatal flaw right now. It's single-threaded. Oh, thanks, OVS. <laughs> I bought this 32-core machine. It's 3.5 gigahertz. It's awesome. And you're using one core. Thanks, dude. So that will, you know, eat that one core, not distribute it to the rest of this awesomely powerful machine, and you start dropping packets. It's really exciting and makes for unhappy tenants. Um, how do you solve that? More VMs! You can virtualize and stick OVS and in, in uh, VMs and having it run on the same machine and then you can distribute it. Um, and that works in our testing. Hopefully we actually figure out how to do it. Um, but of course, then you have more turtles. Um, the other option is to wait for the patch, which actually has been submitted. Um, and hopefully we see it in the Linux kernel at some point so we can 
solve these kinds of problems. Deployment. Deployment is, um, deployment's exciting. Um, my team actually deploys lots of data centers. Um, and, you know, they're, they're never the same. We move incredibly fast, and that's kind of problematic sometimes. Um, that's kind of my own problem. Um, I, I, I highly recommend for deployment um, standardizing and not getting multiple versions of OpenStack out there because that causes all, all kinds of untold uh, issues. Um, yeah, so we use Chef. Um, and uh, we, uh, my team actually started the uh, StackForge uh, repositories. Um, and we've got a lot of other great groups uh, working with us on those. Um, I think there's about 50 Chef cookbooks and lots of recipes in there. They're uncounted because I didn't count them. Um, the, the problem is when you have that many cookbooks is you have eventual consistency. Um, and eventual consistency takes a long damn time if you're <laughs> doing this over lots of servers and, um, you know, Chef doesn't have a really great way of, of uh, having dependencies between these cookbooks and, and really telling you what's going on. So what do we do? Well, we need to orchestrate Chef. Um, and there's lots of good tools out there. Uh, we're actually considering SaltStack um, to basically give us the ability to manage Chef and tell Chef, okay, now you can do this, and now you can do that, and now you can do the other, um, and, and really help uh, bring the time of deployment down and just the whole organization around it. Um, yeah, pretty important. Um, the other thing we have is RabbitMQ. Oh my God, this stresses me out. Um, I don't know if my experience has been as great as Sam's. <laughs> um, we, we are pretty hardcore in our deployment methodology, whereas after we deploy, we start turning stuff off and breaking things um, and making sure that things keep working. And, you know, m for the most part, it works really well. I can shut off my L3 router and it keeps working. And I can shut off parts of my Galera database cluster and it keeps working. And I can, sh you know, turn off random servers and they keep working because they're all HA. And freaking RabbitMQ, not so much. Um, they don't want to join back and they're, they're cute. You, you think Rabbit's great. You're like, awesome. It's great. I, c I can use this to like have this nice message bus and it's great architecturally and then it it falls over all the time when you least expect it and it won't join back in its into its cluster and then you're like stop it rabbit <laughs> you're killing me I hate the rabbit um so so what's the solution to this well there's other queuing systems out there. I know uh, Red Hat uses Cupid. Um, there's ZeroMQ. Um, there's NanoMQ. Um, there's plenty of queuing systems out there. And how do you, how do you solve this, this whole queuing problem? And honestly, um, we're not going with any of those things. Um, Cupid, I don't know a lot about. ZeroMQ, um, I started researching and found people complaining about the exact same issues that we're having. And NanoMQ is the creator of ZeroMQ saying, Nano, uh, ZeroMQ sucks, I now must write NanoMQ. So of course it's brand new and he's got like a design and that's about it. So what do we do? The solution is to stick to the Vorpal Bunny you know and not the one you don't know. And for now, we have, we have Rabbit running fairly reliably with an incredible amount of work. But it is a pain in the butt. And we have lots and lots and lots of testing. Next on the list is uh, storage. 
Um, storage is actually a pretty good story, I think. Um, that hasn't been a thing that stressed me out too much, other than the fact that there are about a billion vendors for storage. Um, and I talk to a lot of them. And, and uh, coming out of that and figuring out you know, what you want to use, and there's a lot of really good solutions out there. They all have interesting stories. Evaluating them in some sane manner is, uh, it can be pretty difficult. Um, but I think the most important thing is, w one of the most important aspects of, of OpenStack, in my opinion, is storage and having you know, people be able to have reliable data. Um, and knowing that that data that they stored someplace is still going to be there tomorrow. Um, you can lose a lot of other things. You know, I can lose a VM, I can lose the network, but if I lose your data, you're going to have problems. Um, and so, really, you want redundancy um, as part of your solution, and you also want redundancy. Um, so, there's lots of great solutions. Um, GlusterFS and Ceph, we had great talks on those. Um, there's certainly hardware solutions out there that you can go with as well, um, including some companies that are actually being really innovative as well, not just the big uh, incumbents. Um, so those are, uh, you know, those are pretty important. Um, so evolution is, um, a really big one and one of the biggest things that stressed me out with OpenStack and it's the fact that this massive code base is changing over time incredibly quickly and you know doing releases across six month periods of time isn't necessarily the easiest thing in the world you're you're having data my mi database migrations and mass code changes and all this kind of thing. Um, and it can become incredibly difficult to, to keep up with that. Um, and if you, the further and further you get behind, the less and less patches are gonna get backported or anybody's even gonna care. Um, and, and developers, I don't think, tend to test very big migrations, right? You have a lot of people testing the very small changes. Not many people ch change, uh, testing the big changes. And so, what we need to do is have mechanisms, and, and uh, Dr. Nick talked about this in his talk, is you know you need to be able to embrace change um, and continuous deployment is the way to do that. Um, you know, I think I love the work that's going on with Triple O. Um, having the ability to continuously deploy um, is, is really important because uh, then you can keep up. Um, it's, it's not easy, but you know, one of the um, best projects that I worked on for this was, uh, was buzz.com. Um, we deployed every day. Um, and that was really great, because it was always just a very small amount of change. And bam, if something broke, you knew what it was, because it was like you know 20 lines of code. So it makes you being able to react a lot better. And you also get really, really good at deployment. Um, I, th I think that you know, if, if, if you suck at deployment, or if deployment is hard, don't do it less. Because that means you're going to get worse at it, not better at it. Um, so deploy, deploy, deploy. Um, and it's, you know, it's certainly an unsolved problem. Um, I got that nugget of wisdom from Dr. Nick. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but I think um, it's also an important thing to, to figure out um, in this OpenStack world. And I think also, along with that, is learning to migrate. Learning to, uh, and what I mean by migrate is migrating tenants. Um, because, you know, you, I feel like e even with continuous deployment, you're going to run into situations where you're like, oh shit, where do I go? What do I do? How do I, you know, go from, say, you know, Nova Network multi-host to a full SDN solution, right? 
that's a very difficult task. And you may not be able to do an in-place upgrade. So how do I take my tenants and move them over transparently and make everything happy? Um, this is a problem I wish we would have solved years ago um, in our deployments. I think it would have reduced a lot of headaches that we had. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there was a way to do continuous deployment in the Diablo uh, era, but, uh, but migration you certainly could have done. Um, lastly, we have one of my favorite um, pain points, which is uh, OSI level eight, layer eight. I don't know if you've all heard of this one. It's called tenants or people. <laughs> um, it's a pretty difficult layer to live with. Uh, I feel like my clouds would be a lot cleaner if I didn't have anybody on them. Um, right now they look like that. Um, <coughs> Ten tenants are fun to work with. Uh, I, I actually do, <coughs> excuse me, um, a lot of tenant engagement and teaching people in my company about cloud and how things work and how you architect things and, um, you know, what to do. And, and, you know, some people really embrace the cloud model and some people say, you know, give me a terabyte of RAM on my VM you know, or other crazy stuff. Oh, great, thanks for, this, thanks for the virtual servers. Can you put this hardware in your cage and plug it into my virtual server? No, no thank you. Um, it, you also have issues on around security. Security is a huge area with tenants. They don't know what they're doing. Um, and it is very scary saying, hey, here's a VM and your root. Go do what you want to do. Um, there's nothing to stop that person from going in and saying, this stupid SSH key stuff is dumb. I want to use a password. And passwords are hard to type, so my password is password. Guess what? That doesn't work for security. You get hacked within minutes and I've seen it happen where people go in and change it and they're done. You have hacked VMs and it really can make a mess of things. Um, and so uh, it, it's pretty exciting. Or you know you install, I don't know, Tomcat with all the default settings. We well, won't change anything. Or PHP my admin. There's lots of tools out there that are like great but they're by default, very, very insecure. And when you're allowing tenants to go in and do whatever fun things they want to, like open up every port in a security group, you open yourself up for trouble. Um, so I think an important thing here is uh, education. Um, you know, you need to get really good at um, educating tenants um, teaching them about security, teaching them about um, how to architect cloud, giving them good documentation around your cloud, um, and and doing as much hand-holding as you can. Um, because really, without the tenants, you're kind of nothing. You've got this awesome cloud that nobody's using. It, it's really important to teach them. Um, the other solution that I like is PaaS. Um, I, I love the idea of Cloud Foundry, Heroku, I use all the time. Um, you get rid of a lot of those problems because you can make the infrastructure decisions. You can decide how your database is secure. Hey, I, I can't log into an, a, a, you know, have an SSH shell if I don't want one in my PaaS solution. Um, and, you know, you can help people um, just deliver applications. PaaS is one of the fastest ways to get there. Um, and I'm sure there's a hell of a lot more stress involved in actually managing one, but hey, it's fun. Um, anyway, uh, OpenStack is a lot of work. 
Um, my team spent three years working on it. Um, and it's only getting bigger and only getting, it's getting better in a lot of ways, but there's always new stuff there. Um, there's there's uh, a lot of great stuff that's coming along um, that I'm really excited about in OpenStack. And I think, you know, the almost the most important thing when you're working on OpenStack is having a really great team um, and, you know, in working with the OpenStack community, one of the things that I've really enjoyed most about it is, is uh, being with a group of people that really care about open source and care about contributing and, and the community is very uh, embracing of other people. Um, and that's really helped the journey that, that we've had. Um, and there's my cloud. Thanks, any questions?